Welcome to our Good Friday service for Christchurch. In these current times, there's lots of things that, that aren't happening or are being cancelled, but it's very keen that along with our Sunday morning services as they go on week by week, um, that we would have a Good Friday service because it would be all too easy for us to go from Palm Sunday, which is past, and all the jubilation and excitement that it brings, through to Easter Sunday, the Resurrection Day, and a celebration of that um, that is coming up. It would be too easy for us to jump from one Sunday to the next and to miss out the very important part in between of what we think about on Good Friday. As we focus especially on the cross and what Jesus did for us there and that which lies at the very heart of our Christian faith. Often at this service on Good Friday evening we would share together around the Lord's table in communion and by that we are obeying Jesus', Jesus instruction to remember him in that way. The question has been asked well could we do that remotely each in our own homes to share a communion together? Well the view of the Central Church has been that it isn't something that can easily be transferred from what we do together in church to what we would do apart at home to do that online and to do it remotely. And the suggestion has rather been that we take this as a time of lament, a time of longing, a time we're sharing around the Lord's table is one more thing that we're not able to do at this time, but we look forward to it, we anticipate it, and we will appreciate it all the more when the opportunity is for us there for it to gather back together in church and to share one with each other all together around the Lord's table at that time. So as we come and worship together on this Good Friday, we hear these words from 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, where it says of Jesus, He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Amen. And we thank God for these words. As we reflect during this service on what Jesus has done for us on the cross, we're going to begin by our, with our first song as we will sing together, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. especially about what Jesus did for us on the cross. The cross lies at the very heart of our Christian faith and it's right that we would reflect on it often even each day to think about what Jesus has done for us. 
but it's right at this particular time of year that we would reflect, reflect especially upon that to think about all that he went through for us to think about his death and all that led up to it Lord as we think about the cross and as we ponder and reflect upon it it reminds us of two great things the first is the problem of our sin if the cross is the solution for our sin and such a brutal and awful thing was necessary to deal with our sin it shows us that sin really is a problem so often we want to just brush it to the side and to laugh it off but the cross reminds us that sin really is serious it really is bad and it needs to be dealt with and dealing with it took something so substantial as that the cross also reminds us of your great love for us that Jesus dying on the cross was necessary for us but such is your love for us that you're willing to go through all of that for us, showing us that we are loved beyond our understanding, loved beyond reason, loved beyond what we deserve to be loved. And we're shown that in the cross. Lord, help us through our service now to take time to reflect on what you have done for us, to think about why it was necessary and to think about the love that you have shown to us by it. Lord, may we rightly reflect on these things. May we wonder in amazement as we survey that wondrous cross. May we think about what you have done for us. May we praise you rightly. May we confess our sin as you make us aware of it and our need to confess that to you. And may we respond as the last, verses of, the last verse of the song we were just singing encourages us to do. Where it says, Where the whole realm of nature mine, that were an offering far too small, love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. As we think about what you've done for us, help us to think how we rightly respond to that by giving to you our soul, our lives and our all. So help us all in these things. May we know your presence with us. May we hear your voice and be ready to respond to it. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We come on now to our first reading within this service. It comes from Isaiah, it's Isaiah's prophecy um, about what Jesus would go through from Isaiah chapter 53. Kevin Cooper is going to read that for us along with a verse from Luke, which helps us to understand how this prophecy was fulfilled um, by Jesus. Then after we've had our, our reading, we're going to have a time of quiet reflection. And the words of that same Bible passage, Isaiah chapter 53, they will show up on the screen um, a few verses at a time. It will stay on the screen for, for long enough that you have time to read it and um, to begin to reflect on it and maybe offer prayers of, of praise and of thanksgiving to God uh, for what you see within those verses. The next few verses will move on, and then on it will go. And uh, For about three or four minutes it will take for that passage to go through, and there's no music, there's nothing behind it, it's just simply a time of quiet reflection um, upon God's word. And then when those verses have gone through, we'll go on then into our, our next song, um, which is O to See the Dawn, with the chorus, The Power of the Cross. But we begin this section now uh, with Kevin reading from God's word. Isaiah chapter 53 He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked, and with the rich in his death 
though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied by the knowledge my righteous servant will justify many and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great and he will divide the spoils with the strong because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. And from Luke chapter 22, Jesus said, it is written, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And I tell you that this must be fulfilled in me. In me. Yes, what is written about me is reaching its fulfillment. Amen. And this is the word of God.
We're going to hear again now from God's Word. Uh, This next reading comes from Mark's Gospel, Mark chapter 15, and I'll be reading from verse 16 through to the end of verse 39. And this is the Word of God. The soldiers led Jesus away into the palace, that is the praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him, then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. They began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews! Again and again, they struck him on the head with their staff and spat on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put on his own own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it, and they crucified him. Dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see what each would get. It was the third hour when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. They crucified two robbers with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So, you're going to destroy the temple and build it in three days. Come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Christ, this King of Israel, come down from the cross that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. At the sixth hour, darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, They said, listen, he's calling Elijah. One man ran, filled a sponge with with wine vinegar and put it on a stick and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus, heard his cry and saw how he died. He said, surely this man was the Son of God. Amen. And we thank God for his word. So we are in the midst at this time of this coronavirus pandemic. A few months ago, I'd never heard of the term coronavirus. Um, Seemingly, as they've talked about this, there are lots of different coronaviruses. Um, Some of them are quite common and we're familiar with them. Um, But one in particular is causing a a, a trouble, a particular trouble at the minute. And that leads to COVID-19 and all the problems um, that come with that. And you've probably seen a picture like this um, on the news quite often when someone is talking about coronavirus. There'll be something like this um, up, up behind them. And this is what the coronavirus looks like when it is placed under a microscope. Now, I never did Latin at school, um, but I have been told that that corona, the first part of coronavirus, is the Latin word for crown. So the coronavirus, it it looks, is the virus that looks like a crown, and that's the idea. If you think about the edge of a crown and all the wee bits that stick up around it, well, that's what the coronavirus looks like. If you see it in great detail, it looks like a crown, whether you agree with that or not, but you get the idea that that is what they're talking about. The coronavirus is the virus that looks like a a crown. And if it is like a crown, well, it's a really, 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 really tiny little crown. In real life, these things are so small that we can't see them. There are many of them together, um, but it's so small that we can't see it. And that's why it's a problem when it's spread. We don't see these things flying about because they're absolutely minute. But for something so small, it is having a huge impact upon our lives. And if we think about that idea of the crown, a crown is a symbol of power and of authority. Now, the coronavirus doesn't have power and authority. It doesn't rule in the conventional sense. But it is, in a way, 
exercising power over us. It is changing the patterns of our lives. It is keeping us at home. It is restricting our movement. And it is impacting some individuals and families much more deeply. It is right that we would change our, our pattern of meeting and our way of life. It's right that we would do that at the minute. We need to be wise and to listen and to heed and to follow all of the current and up-to-date guidance. But there is a danger that we give coronavirus too much power. That we give it a power that it doesn't rightly deserve. We allow it to rule in ways that it shouldn't. And this happens when we go from being cautious and being sensible to being crippled by fear. To allowing worry to overtake us. Or even to think that our, our future is in the hands of this virus. Or if we think that that which lies ahead is only despair. There is no hope. There is no way forward. If we get into that position, we have allowed coronavirus to take on a crown and to rule in ways that, that it shouldn't and that isn't right. And we know that that's not right, but sometimes we can find ourselves heading in this direction. So yes, we should be wise and listen to guidance and all that we're told. But we shouldn't so go so far as to allow our thinking about coronavirus to overtake us. So how do we keep things in the right balance? How do we get the right level on all of this? Well, as with everything that we come across in life, we need to listen to what God says to us about it. And there are a lot of big questions that are raised by a crisis like this. Where is God in the midst of all of this? Why doesn't he just stop it? Why does he not just call it to a halt just like that? Sometimes people in discussion of human suffering, they suggest a picture of God at a distance, lying on a deck chair. Here we are on earth suffering and struggling and facing all that we are. Meanwhile, God is just sitting out somewhere on a deck chair, resting in a cloud. That notion of God at a distance, removed and almost oblivious from what is going on in this world. That's sometimes where people end up in their view and their idea of God when they're faced with, with struggling and pressures on this earth. That's where they end up in their view of God. Now responding to these things isn't simple. Of course God is not sitting on a deck chair in a cloud somewhere, but how do we respond to that? It's difficult. It brings challenges to us, but the Bible does have plenty to say to us and that will help us. And I want to carry forward this idea of the crown that we've started thinking about and to reflect on two crowns that the Bible talks about that help us in our whole understanding of this. The first of these crowns was mentioned in our reading from Mark's Gospel just a moment or two, or just a moment or two ago, when Jesus was being taken away by the soldiers to be crucified. Mark tells us that they twisted together a crown of thorns and they put it on him. Crown of thorns is the first of the two crowns that we're looking at from the Bible this evening. And so when people ask the question, well, what does God know about suffering? The answer to that is he knows far more than we ever will. Far from being a God in a deck chair in the sky, removed from the painful realities of this world, the crown of thorns and all that followed it tells us most clearly that God is not removed from our sufferings. He is not detached and at a distance oblivious to all that we go through on this earth. In fact, God knows all about human suffering. And as we think about Jesus' suffering, as we read of it here in Mark's Gospel and the other Gospels, there are at least three different aspects or ways of thinking about the suffering of Jesus. The first is the physical suffering, as the crown of thorns was placed on Jesus' head. Those big long thorns were sticking down into his head, each one piercing his skin and causing him great pain. A reading from Mark's Gospel there talked about how they hit him in the head and with every one of those blows, the thorns were being driven down into his head. Prior to this, verse 15 tells us that he had already been flogged. On to verse 21, we read of Jesus carrying his cross and then to verse 24, it talks about how they crucified him. The most painful physical death and the bible at that point doesn't dwell too much on the human suffering but it very much is there and real jesus really suffered in all that he went through but as well as that physical suffering there was also the mental and the emotional suffering that he experienced jesus was betrayed by one of his friends 
He was denied by another of his friends. At this point when he is being crucified, all the rest of his disciples have scarpered and dispersed. All bar John, who was close by. Jesus was denied justice. He was lied about. He was mocked and humiliated. All of this to add on top of the physical suffering that he is going through. But even still, the physical suffering and the emotional suffering, which were more than we can even begin to imagine, they weren't the worst of it. They weren't the worst that Jesus went through on that day. The very worst thing that Jesus experienced was spiritual, as he experienced a break in his relationship with his Father. For all eternity past, God the Father and Jesus, God the Son, had a perfect relationship with each other. Forever, from before this world was made and all eternity past, that perfect relationship. And we get a few brief insights to that, into the very close depth of that relationship between Jesus and his Father. But at this point, there was a break as the Father turned his face away. As Jesus was dying on the cross, there was darkness over the whole earth, and Jesus cried out those words, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And this shows the utter agony that Jesus was feeling at this point when the Father turned his face away from him. All of this shows us that God is not detached or removed from our suffering. As Isaiah 53, which we heard and reflected on earlier, also tells us, Jesus was despised and rejected, familiar with pain. He was stricken. He was afflicted. These are some of the words, even in the early verses, that start to tell us about what Jesus would go through. Whatever you may be experiencing at this time, you can be confident that God understands. If you're finding physical isolation difficult, God understands. If you are in physical pain, God understands. If your whole world is being turned upside down at present, God understands. If you feel the pressure of everything that you're experiencing and going through at this time just weighing on you so heavily, God understands. We can be absolutely sure that whatever we go through, whatever we will go through, as we bring these things to God, as we cry out for his help, for his mercy, and for him to walk alongside us through these things, we can be absolutely confident that we come to a God who understands. Now, is that the only reason why Jesus went through all of these things? Was it just so he could understand that when we come to him in prayer that he could understand and have an insight into what we went through? Well, it was something more than that. Why Jesus bore that crown of thorns and all that went through it. Jesus was doing something more than simply identifying with us and coming to understand our pain. By all that he went through, Jesus was dealing with the root cause of our suffering. So we ask the question, well, why is there suffering in the world? Why is there this coronavirus which is causing such trouble at present? Well, the simple answer is sin. Now, that's not to say that coronavirus is a consequence of a particular sin, either in society in general or in an individual's life. Certainly, we shouldn't think of it in that way. But in a general sense, there is suffering in the world because there is sin. Ever since Adam and Eve sinned right back in Genesis chapter 3, their relationship with God was broken, their relationship with each other was broken, and the relationship with the world that they live in was broken. And as part of that broken relationship with the world and the breaking of the world and its proper order, comes bugs and viruses and all these different things come as a result of that. They are a product and an effect of the fallen world that we live in. The world is not in it as it was when God initially created it. It's not as it should be. Well, then people go on to ask the question, well, can God not fix that? Can he not stop it? Why can he not stop the bad things that are going on in this world? Well, that's actually a more complicated thing than what it just seems. So people say, well, why does God not stop the bad that is going on? And when they say this, they say, well, why does he not stop this bad virus that's going on out there? Why does he not stop the bad things that people are doing out there? 
And they want God to stop the bad that is out there. But you know, about bad in the world, there's lots of it out there. Do you know where else there's bad? There's plenty of bad in here as well. There's bad attitudes in my heart. There's bad words that flow out of my mouth, things that I shouldn't say, ways that I respond that are not right. There are wrongful actions that I do. And the same is true for each one of us. There's lots of bad within us that comes out in different ways. But it's there. So if we say, why can't God wipe out all the bad? Well, he wouldn't just do it out there. He would be doing it here as well. And I would be part of that, of what he would wipe out. For God to wipe out the bad, it would be only fair that he wipes out this bad as well as that bad. And so that solution, while it seems nice, God, come and remove all the bad from this world. Well, actually, it's a little bit more complicated and it takes a bit more than that. But God is God. He is able to deal with these things and it's no problem for him to work out the right and proper solution to this problem. A solution which would allow him to take the bad from me without destroying me. And a solution which enables him to set right all that is wrong within this world. And that is what Jesus was doing as he died upon the cross. The problem of all that is wrong with this world comes down to that very simple and short word, sin. And what Jesus was doing as he died on the cross was taking our sin upon himself. He was taking my sin and the sin of others. He was taking that all upon himself taking the punishment that we rightfully deserved. That crown of thorns should be on my head for the wrong things that I have done. But instead, Jesus said, no, I am going to take that for you. I am going to bear that crown of thorns and all that goes with it. I am going to take that for you so that you can be set free. That is what Jesus was doing for us on the cross, taking our sin and the punishment for it upon himself so that we can go free. Jesus did all of this for us By his death on the cross, which was then proven by his resurrection, God raised him from the dead, showing us that all that Jesus set about achieving on the cross had been completed, was done, was successful. And now we live in this time in between. So if we think about that which has happened over over Easter, where we think about Jesus' death, his resurrection, and then a few weeks later, of how Jesus ascended into heaven, we think of a future day when Jesus will return, And there's this time in between. And that is where we live at present. In this time of what is sometimes described as the already but not yet. And so already we have some of the benefits that Jesus died to bring to us. We have a restored relationship with God when we put our trust in Jesus. Our relationship with God is restored at that point. We're able to talk to God. We're able to know him dwelling inside us by his Holy Spirit. We're able to know him walking with us through all that we go through in life. We know his blessing in so many ways. We know that already. We have that with us now. But yet we don't have all the benefits just yet. We still sin. Even though our sin has been forgiven, we continue and we go on sinning. And we still suffer the consequences of sin. We still live in in this broken and fallen world. And we still experience the consequences of that sin in this broken world. So we live in that time in between where Jesus has already achieved all that was necessary to fix it. But it hasn't yet come in full, which it will when Jesus returns. And part of the reason why God is leaving this period of time between those two events is that he's giving us an opportunity to come to him, to seek his forgiveness, to put our trust in him, and to ask him to be our saviour and our Lord. When Jesus returns, that time will have passed. The opportunity to do that will be no more. And so God in his grace is giving us this current time to turn to him and put our trust in him. And it may well be that God is working through this current coronavirus, to help people to be more alert to eternal things, to things that matter, to things that are more important than that which so normally occupies us, to make people even think about these bigger matters, that God is at work through this to help people to be aware of him, their need for him, and during this time, this strange time that we're going through, to awaken to their need for him and put their trust in him. It's very likely that God is at work in some people's lives in this way at this time. Maybe even for you, you're not quite sure of where you stand before God. 
If that point came where Jesus returns, you don't know where you are before him. And so by his grace, God is giving you this time to turn to him, to put your trust in him. If you've never done that, there's no better time to do that than now. If God is nudging on your heart, if he's causing you to think about these things and to realise maybe that you knew this already, but you need to respond to it. Well then, do that now. I encourage you to just pick up the phone to me at any time and I'd be very glad to talk to you about these things and anything that you want to do in response to that. So there is coming this day when Jesus will, will return, when all that is wrong in this world will be set right. And the coming of that day brings us on then to our second cry. The Apostle Paul wrote these words as he neared the end of his life and they're recorded for us in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Familiar words where it says, The time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but to all who long for his appearing. What lies ahead for all who have put their trust in Jesus Christ is this crown of righteousness. When the crown of thorns is a picture of suffering, the crown of righteousness reflects our place in God's glorious and perfected kingdom. We deserve the crown of thorns as a punishment for our sin, but Jesus took that for us. The crown of righteousness rightly belongs to Jesus. He alone is the righteous one. But he has chosen in his grace to share that crown of righteousness for us. To take the crown of thorns that we rightly deserved upon himself. And instead to give the, us the crown of righteousness that was rightly his. He gives it to us so that we can share in all of that that rightly belonged to Jesus. All the glory and riches of heaven that's rightly his. He says I'm sharing it with all of you. You can have some of that as well. When the right time comes, Jesus will return and all that he achieved by his death and resurrection will be available in full. We have some of it and some hints and the Bible calls it the first fruits of that now. But it will come in full when Jesus returns. Everything that is wrong with this world will be set right. As the wee book that we've been looking at over a few weeks on Sunday says, at that time there will be nothing bad ever. There will be no one sad Ever. As Revelation puts it, there will be no more crying or mourning or pain or death. All of this is what Jesus came to achieve and did achieve by his death upon the cross. He proved it by his resurrection from the dead, showing that all of this was true and right, that eternal life is possible and is real. He proved it to us by his resurrection. And when Jesus returns, all of this will come in full. And so what does this tell us? Well, it tells us that our future is not defined by coronavirus and whatever it may bring. Our future is marked by a different crime, a crime of righteousness, a crime of righteousness to, which is promised to all who have faith in Jesus Christ. That defines our future, this crime of righteousness. And that which defines our future, and when we know that what is ahead is secure and has been set for us by Jesus, well, that comes back into the present. When we know that the future is secure, then we have hope, we have comfort, we have peace in the present. Because we know that the one who did all of that to secure our future is not going to leave us, is not going to let us down, and we can be confident that he will surely see us through our present challenges. Let's pray together. Lord God, we thank you that we can come to you. We thank you that even now the way is open for us to come to you because of Jesus and because of death, his death upon the cross. Jesus, we thank you for bearing that crown of thorns for us. That which was rightly ours as a punishment for our sin. You took that upon yourself, dying in our place, taking our punishment so that we can be set free. Lord, we thank you that instead of that, you take that crown of thorns that was ours and you give to us instead 
this crown of righteousness, reminding us of our place and of our standing in your kingdom. Lord, we thank you that this is secured, it's certain for everyone who has put their trust in you. Lord, for any who are watching this who haven't yet put their trust in you, Lord, help them now to realise that they need to do that, to have confidence and strength in you, to look to you as Lord and Saviour. Lord, help us all to know that our future is secure, that we can be absolutely confident of that because Jesus did it all upon the cross for us. And help us then as we bring that into the present. For the struggles that we feel are real. The worries can easily grip us. The uncertainty is easy for us to come by. But Lord, help us in dealing with these things to look to you, to look to your truth and to your ways. Lord, help us to put our trust in you wholly and completely. Help us to look to you knowing for all that you have done for us already in the past and in securing our future. Help us to look to you with that sense of confidence that you are not going to let us go now. So help us all. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We come on now to our closing praise. When peace like a river with the chorus, it is well with my soul. Let's praise God together with these words.
let's share these words together at the benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all forevermore. Amen.